for actually being in a paper mill. Mm -hmm. Could you describe each of these rooms for yeah, me, Yeah, I mean, it starts off up at what they call the hydropulpa. It's like a big vat, a big washing machine, and they throw the, the pulp into that, and it gets mixed up to a certain degree. And if it's going to be a coloured one, the dye has to go in as well. And uh, then it comes from there down to the back end of the machine. The machine is, oh, it's huge. I mean, some of them are really quite big. And as I said, it goes on a continuous belt of wire with different jets and heat and everything under it. Then it hits what they call the dandy, which is depends on who you're making it for. Their watermark goes on it. Then it has to go through a series of belts and rollers. And it's, by the time it comes out the other end, it's paper. You know, it's, uh, it's quite a complicated system, but it, it was good. The problem being that if it stopped in the middle, somebody had to crawl in and try and feed it through. I didn't do that. I wouldn't go. I was right into my fingers. I've seen a couple of guys getting caught. You know, the fingers getting caught in the rollers. You know. So they were still going. Oh yeah. Oh, I had to keep going. Yeah, I had to get, because the pulp was still coming down, and it was going into what they called the pit, and the loose paper that was at a certain certain degree that went into the pit. So you had to get keep it going, and and they oh, some of them were excellent with it. They knew exactly how to do it, uh, and then on later on you would have to go down into the pit and bring it all the waste paper and that you know. But I was, it's quite a complicated system. I, I don't know how they do it now, whether it's still in the same way. But it was near the the front end of the machine. It was always sort of steam heated rollers, and that then it got I, at the end. The paper came off and got made into big rolls, and then you had a two-tier system. You had one going with the paper on it, and you had another one ready. So when that one was filled, they had to cut it quickly and wrap it round and get the other one going. Yeah, you know, it was quite interesting to watch. You know, it was interesting to work in it. It was very, very hot, with all the steam. But uh, yeah, it was good fun. It was good, interesting to watch. And some of the guys were, oh, so good at it. You know, but. Uh, I wasn't as good as that, I must admit. I like the weir machines, I, I, I quite like them better. But uh, I, I, I must have spent a good few years in there. I can't remember how long I was in there, but I went back. I left and then went back, but it didn't last long. <laughs> a lot of people think pro making paper is an easy process. It's a very expensive and very a lot of hard work involved in it. Uh, everything starts at the hydros. Uh, the hydro is basically just a pulping machine, and the bales of pulp you get hardwood and softwood mixed together, depending on the grade of paper you're making. It gets pulped, and the pulping takes about maybe an hour for each one single hydro, which supplies the machine with about three tons of paper. That goes onto the beaters, and the beater says where all the chemicals get added onto the paper. Uh, they made stamp paper. They made uh, all kinds of paper printing paper of all kinds. Uh, some of it is very top grade, uh, especially the stamp paper. The stamp paper, before you start an order, the machine had to be cleaned from head to head to toe. Everything had to be spotless. It uh, took 12 hours, 14 hours. Sometimes two shifts, took two shifts to finish the cleaning, and then the process starts. From the beer house, uh, the dyes get added on and all the chemicals needed to make the paper uh, ink proof because certain chemicals if they don't go into the paper uh, the, the ink would just sink th through the paper um, and the, the main chemicals that actually stop that from happening is the starch the starch actually gets added on halfway through the machine process you've got the wet end that's where the machine man is in charge the dry end starts after the wet end that's when the paper is going through the cylinders getting dried and then go to <coughs> the paper goes through the starch and the starch uh, basically is nozzles right across the wood of the machine it pours uh, starch through on the paper and the paper gets sealed and pressed it's all all takes seconds it's very very complicated uh, took me do the good part for about maybe 10 years to know every button for the machine uh, people are, I think uh, a paper a paper machine is uh, tiny. A paper machine could be as long as 150 yards. Yeah, and you've got four people working, and on average shift, I think uh, 
you could walk if you're the gyreman and the laddie you could walk on average about 10 12 miles there's a lot of walk and you have to be quite fit uh, i've done that job for about 11 years uh, i used to put on weight during my fair fortnight holiday you lose you lost that within a week because uh, of the heat and the amount of walking you have to do but it was a good job and uh, it was well paid for the time was it dangerous at all? Yes, well, I, there was a lot, a lot of accidents. Uh, a lot of my friends got small injuries or uh, they got caught in the machine. Uh, I believe uh, quite a few people got hurt. I think one of them was an Inverkidden uh, lad. Can't mind, I can't remember his second name, but the, the incident happened at close down. They closed down the machines about 3 o'clock Saturday afternoon. And... Uh, the machine was actually um, again supplied with hot water from the beaters because they have to flush the whole system, and uh, the hot water was held in a like a stainless steel tank. And instead of adding the the chemical first and then the hot water, they he actually filled the the cylinder with hot water and put the chemical in. Because of the chemical being uh, volatile, it actually exploded all over him and uh, melted part of his foot and uh, he, he was off his work for quite a few months like that's the the worst incident i've seen there but i, I honestly cannot remember the lad's name but he went back to his work eventually and he got compensated for his injuries because he wasn't at fault uh, the supervisor was at fault on the day but the supervisor wasn't present uh, uh, he should have waited and been advised what to do is bleach used? No, bleach is used for cleaning, cleaning the machine afterwards. But uh, we, we used acid for cleaning the pipes, and uh, uh, the acid ran through the pipes and cleans uh, the inside. Saturday was from 3 right up to 6 o'clock in the afternoon. It was always cleaning, uh, a cleaning process. That's uh, the machine getting ready for Monday, Monday morning, morning start. And you probably came across uh, soap stiffeners. Years ago, they used to have uh, small wraps around the soap that was made in Inverkeithen. Yeah. And believe it or not, the starch and what gets added onto the starch and make the, the soap... Uh, uh, the soap can, would not last inside the wrapper unless it's uh, protected from uh, bacteria. And the soap is made with... Uh, a chemical uh, uh, gets added onto the starch and this chemical actually kills all the bacteria in the paper and stays bacteria proof right up to all uh, different households uh, use it. Unfortunately, the chemical they add on to the soap stiffener was poisonous. Once the machine starts and the paper is through, member staff were not allowed to touch anything on the machine till it's dry because the Santobray, that's the chemical they added on to the soap stiffener, and it's a very expensive and very lethal uh, chemical. Yeah. It g doesn't get added on in big quantities, but you can actually smell it in the atmosphere. It's very strong, and uh, killed all the bacteria on the soap. Um, stamp paper was a different process, nice clean uh, process. There was no chemicals added on, just different dyes, and different grade of pulp. I mean top class pulp, like long long fiber and short fiber for uh, stamp paper. And I remember uh, my manager uh, telling me to do a proper clean of the machine because we were about to start, say, maybe 20 or 40 ton of paper for stamp paper. Yeah, It gets delivered to all kinds of uh, uh, printing machine, uh, printing companies all over Britain to make the stamps. And a lot of books were made to, uh, with the paper we made uh, yeah. in number given. Basically for there, uh, the vacancies come up for shift manager and I ended up going on with Sammy Hamilton who was for North Queen's Ferry. He was a shift manager, oh I was a shift manager with him, sorry. I was on with him as supervisor. We're both colour matchers, supervisors, colour matchers, shift manager. Um, they're colour matching. Sammy and I were quite align with each other, we could see the same colours, same hue, same sort of, like if I said to you that 
if I was looking at that white paper, it could be sort of bluey looking, it could be grainy looking, it could be ready looking, you know, in the hues and the LEDs and that. Um, this night, all of a sudden, we couldn't see the same colour. And he told me it was me. Your eyes have changed. Maybe they have, I don't know. So this went on all night and we're bickering about that colour's this and that colour's that. So we kind of hedged between the two colours, but Sammy being the senior man, he got the vote. So he went out and he left his glasses lying, so I put the glasses on. Here he had, his, had new glasses, but they were slightly tinted. And as soon as I seen that, when he come back in, I say, Sammy, I can see the same colour as you now. And I put the glasses on. I says, they're tinted. I never asked for tinted, I says, but they're tinted. I says, it changed the colour. But as soon as I put them on, you could see that thing. So, of course, he was a bit of a fox. He was known as a fox, so he was a bit of a fox. So you sort of, they would, I would come up with a good idea. He would, he would actually down it, not viciously or anything, but he would poo it a wee bit. Then he went away and adopted it. <laughs> so I learned not to tell Sammy too much sometimes if it was something that way, like, you know. So what did you do after being a after, boy? After being a, a, a boy in the finishing house, ended up as an assistant guillotine operator, uh, then ended up as a guillotine operator who was responsible for taking larger sheets of paper and cutting it into A4 uh, or I can't remember what the other one was, but you would principally cut large sheets of paper into small sheets of paper or just trim the edges. So you do four cuts and slide it to the side. The assistant would then put it on a pallet. You then pull the one from the right hand side, trim it, and put it to the other side. So it was hard work. I do mean hard breaking work. If you can imagine, you've got three sheets of A4 in front of you. You've got to cut nine sheets out of a large. So this table will be lifting sheets that size. Two men. What was the actual machine like? A guillotine. There was when I started the semi dangerous job. Uh, it was a large steel bed with a, almost like a guillotine. It was a guillotine uh, that would, when you pull the lever, a gate would come out to protect you from the blade. Uh, it would slice it. It would move back up to its position. You would take the ream out, turn it round, place it in the correct position, pull the lever, the gate would come out, and yes, a few people got teeth smashed because you moved in kind of fa faster than you should have done. Or, in those days, because it was all on wooden floors, the vibration of the machine at the side of you sent your machine into action mode and yes the gate would come out and smack you in the mouth no problem this guard that you mentioned was that always there the guard was always there and the older machines can't remember the names but greg sticks in my mind it was a, a large metal gate that when the blade came down the guard came out to meet you uh, so for speed, you tried to time it correctly, so you were going in when the gate was going in, but if you timed it wrong and it was coming out, you got a nice metal bar in your face. The new ones have got electric eyes on the side. Uh, that's when, when I sort of left, they were bringing in electric eyes on, on the side of them, so you, you couldn't move forward. There was no gate going to hurt you. And how long did you work there? Probably worked there for about 10 years. For there, uh, I got the opportunity to be a machine man. And I'm not sure, I think it was about that time, I don't know if you mind, because you're too young, see. Um, 
that they made everybody retire at 65. Talk about men, in particular, because it was mostly men. It was in not in the finishing side, but in the working side, the pyramid side. They retired everybody. I think it was the Labour government. I think it brought in, and they retired everybody, and that took a wealth. I mean, you had people at 80, 80 odd year old that were just finished up. You know, that learnt me another lifestyle as well when that happened. Um, but that gave me the opportunity then to move up the ladder because for you could be 15 years as a driverman, not even get a move to anyway, but that caused the movement within the mill. So I ended up getting the number one machine man's job. Not that it's the number one machine, number five was a big machine. Um, that was the machine I was on. So because of my youth work and whatever, my whole aim as a machine man was to do my job right but also work as a team like together as a team was the secret for good work and encourage people to work as best they can for the company but for ourselves and the end result was good good paper Mr Greenlee and uh, the, yeah. did your mum work in the mill when she was young yes Mm -hmm. And do you know what job she did? She would start in the cutters, as I did, as everybody, you know, the women did, in the cutters where they, they cut the reels of paper into sheets. I think you are about a year, I think we were about a year on the cutters, and then you went upstairs to be a stamper for the guys that made all the bales of paper. You had to stamp up the sides where it was going to and what kind of paper it was. Um, and then I think you were about a year on that and then you went to the learners and um, there was a lady, Mary McNeil, when I was there, I don't know who done it when my mum was there, but when I was there it was a lady uh, called Mary McNeil and she taught you either to overhaul the paper or count it and it was all done by hand then. So I was a counter, my mum was an overhauler, my sister was an overhauler. Eh? Could you explain what an overhauler is? Overhauler, once it's been cut into sheets, you know, the paper, it's big, well, it's all different sizes. They, they, they had a table that they stood at and they had rubber things on their finger, like rubber tubing, really. And they overhauled and they looked at the paper to see if there was faults in it. And then once they, the box was filled, they brought it to me and I had a huge table and they each had their spot where they put their paper and I had to count it into reams. It was hard work, you know. You fanned it up and counted it four sheets at a time. And then folded it over and put it on a board and then it went away to the tyres where it was all bailed up, eh? How many um, pieces of sheeting was there to a ream? Oh, it depended. It could be 500. It, could, it all varied. It depended. You know, it could be 400, 450. I think the most was 500 sheets in a ream, yeah. So I spoke to my mum and dad. I want to go to the paper mill. And I started off on the cars, on the far end, because um, it was east end and the far end, the, w the west end. But anyway, I was I was on the far end, and it was uh, Jimmy Fraser was my cutter man, and I was working on his car with another girl, and I can't remember who it was. Um, it was just. The rolls of paper would come through from the machine shop and they would get put on the machine at the back and then we would put the, the boards in and fix them. And I did that until I was, I think I was about 16 and a half, something like that. And then what you did then was you went up the stair to the tyres. Now the tyres are the, the men who tied up the reams of paper that the overhaulers and the counters had checked and they wrapped it all up and I was called a stamper because I put the labels on and the little, we had um, uh, little wooden things that we had put, to put teeps on with the, the, the um, the name and the number that was to go on certain parcels and uh, 
Then we stacked them on boards. Um, and then the the tyres who were Jimmy Vaughan and Davy Syme. That was my two tyres. And uh, there was oh, loads of people in, in it from Inverkeen. My Uncle Harry was there as a, sty, a tyre. Uh, Joe Glyzett from the ferry, he was a tyre. Um, I'm getting a wee bit lost with, with the names and what have you. Um, you went to the, the stamping first, then you went to the learners, and you learnt how to overhaul the paper. So you got a lift of paper, it was about that much, and that was put onto your table that you were on with um, Bella, I can't remember her second name, Bella was there to teach you how to do the overhauling, and it was a, a thing where you got two pieces of rubber or one piece of rubber to put on your fingers, and it was like that. The paper that a thingy of paper was put there and you had to pull one sheet at a time in and then thing it up so that it was in neat and tidy and you did that and then when you got your uh, got the this bits here full um, you had to count them so you had to get the corner of the paper and thing it up and then bring your fingers through and count it and then put it at the side with a piece of paper uh, to separate from the next one and when you were efficient enough at doing that you got put onto the big tables and normally it was a case of a uh, there was two lots um, a lot down this end and a lot up that end and the reason for that is because I had to get round the tables with a scooter with the boards of paper on it and uh, that was where you went and you earned your pay. So the more paper that you overhauled, the more money you got at the end of the week. And there was two, uh, two females on each table because they were great big long tables. And then there was um, men who would, after the, they had the reams of paper had been all tied up and everything, there was the other guys who were there and they would take the boards of paper into the lift and down the stair and take them through to, now, it would have been either the steeps or the loading bay, because that was these big places that uh, they were kept down the stair. And that was just across from the um, where the big cutters were. Um, there was three ordinary cars and there was a little car, and then there was an angle car. Um, the angle car was the, the most interesting one, I, I, I really think, because, as it says, it cut the paper on an angle. And Was it noisy throughout the mill? Yes. No, I couldn't, uh, couldn't, unless you were maybe in the electrician shop or the... Uh, engineering shop even that would be a bit noisy but noise was definitely part of the process because the, the in the finishing house these heavy scooters run on metal plates so you you know on the metal staircases you see that kind of corrugated that's what that was round about was the area that these scooters worked on so yeah the noise was constant there was no let up in noise and apart from a few hundred chattering women at the same time, so... <laughs> Can you explain the scooters, please? The scooters are the normal ones you see uh, kicking around these days. They haven't changed any. Uh, they were changing to electric ones when I, I sort of was ready to leave, but, you, you know, you had to pump them up and pull these pallets of heavy paper around the building. And, that, and as I say, whether it was taking it off the machines and very large reels, putting it onto a trolley, again, large metal wheels, you were pushing heavy weights all the time. Uh, men were really pushing heavy stuff. Well, and even the young boys, the young girls even, 
at the end of the cutter house, they were taking large pallets of paper and moving it to another part of there. So even the girls at that time knew what heavy work was, and especially the ladies in the, the finishing house. They, they used to pile the paper, reams of paper, at least six to seven feet high. Fold it, large rooms of paper, fold them up into a nice bundle, put one on top of the other, flatten it out, straighten it up, and that's what boys used to move on, on pallets. No problem at all. But it was good money, that's why I wanted to really. It was piecework, was it? Not at the cutters, but in, in upstairs in the counting and overhauling it was piecework. Yeah. So you were paid weekly? Yes. Do you remember how much it was? Oh, okay. it varied because it was piecework here, but it was, you were paid in money. You got a wee envelope on a Thursday, a Thursday night, it was great, you know. Got your pay packet lined up at the office and got your little brown envelope. And you, you had already, oh, well, it's kind of, I could work out what, roughly what I was going to get. And, um, and the overhaulers, they could, you know, it was, I can't remember now, but it probably doesn't sound a lot of money now, but it was good money. I was actually making more than my husband, well, when I married my husband, he worked in the dockyard, he left the paper and we went to the dockyard. I was earning more money than him, yeah. Probably worked harder than him, probably, you know. But, um, yeah, it wasn't a bad place then. They changed all the system. There was, I think there was a new, there was, that used to be run by the family, the Smiths, the Smith brothers were sort of the top bosses. Um, and then I think they sold it to another company and it, it all changed, changed the system and I got that I, I just didn't want to work there anymore. You know, you when when I was counting on a table I'd be lucky if I had paper like that. You used to stand on a stool and count it and lift it and count it and lift it and then pile it on another board. When they went into this help yourself to the paper and overhaul it, sometimes I was away up here counting paper and I thought I just didn't want to do that anymore. You know. Was that quite dangerous? It was, yeah. Used to stand on a board, you know, a big like a pallet, you know. Mm -hmm. And then if it was really high you put another board on top and a stool. I couldn't do that now because I would fall over but um but you were young, you just didn't think anything of it, you know. Did you work a regular shift pattern? Yes, yeah. Could, can you remember what that was? I think it was seven till quarter past five at night, you know. Um then they started, when the reason my mother came back, she got part-time. I didn't go part-time, I was too young to do that. Eh? Um, but they made part-time, they had part-time workers, then full-time workers. But you worked, started at seven, but then you got a breakfast about, I think it was quarter to nine to quarter to ten. Um, and then you had your lunch, and then you finished at five, quarter past five. Eh? Yeah. It's quite a long day, but I think when you're young you don't... I couldn't have done what my mum done. I would never have wanted to go back to that at her age. Eh? When I think, say, her age, she was probably in her forties, you know. But to me, she was. I wouldn't have done that. Eh? But um, she wanted to her holidays, and she wanted this, that, and the other. So she she worked for it. Did a lot of women go back? Yes, they did. Yeah, most of my friends' mothers, I can, all went back when the part time eh, eh, came in. Yeah. Part-time jobs, were they introduced to try and get all the women back? I think it was. I think because probably some of the younger folk, as they went on, probably didn't want to go to the paper mill, you know, and they maybe needed uh, the older women to come back and, and fill in because there was quite a few came back. Yeah. Can you tell me about that night? Yeah, I was, I was due to start at 6 o'clock, but I went away to watch them filming. I was a big Dunfermline supporter then. Went wait, watched Dunfermline play East Stirling or Stirling Albion. It was one of the two. Excuse me, one of the two. And uh, it was in, in the Scottish Cup and Dunfermline won 6 2. And I was a bit late in coming back. And I just got along to my, my, my place of work at the Calendars. And uh, Bill Hind, who was my friend at that time, he was asked me how the game had went. And uh, I says, oh, it was fine, it was a good game. And then the next thing, the alarms started ringing. I says, oh, I'm not having a test at the start of the shift. And then somebody else come running through saying that there had been a, an explosion at the grass plant, uh, or as they called it, the duster. So 
Bill worked on the pulper, so him and I went away through and up the stairs and over to the grass plant. And you had to go up a big flight of iron stairs. And as I was going up, Harry Westwater came down, who was in charge of the boilers up there. And he, I says, where's my dad? He says, I haven't seen your dad. I said, what happened? He says, it just blew. So we went along to where they normally throw the grass into the boilers. Couldn't get in. Uh, there was no stairs. So we went back out and round the front, and that's where we found Bill Easton lying on the railway tracks in a really bad way. Um, we got people over to, to him, and then I said, we'll go round the back and come over the grass. And when we went into the storage, but as we opened up the back door, this other guy who had only been there about two weeks, I think, he, he was coming out. And I said, have you seen my dad? He says, no. I says, I haven't seen him, because there was only the three men there. So we couldn't get up to where, because the floor had given way. So then the safety officer come and pulled us out. He told us to get away out the road. So I think it was Davy Prattis that come and got hold of me, and he says, come on. He said, we'll go and get a cup of tea. Leave them to it. I said, no, I don't want to go. He said, no, come on. So we went along, and we're sitting in the safety officers uh, Bolton and I heard I heard them saying something about um, uh, they found somebody uh, and somebody saying have you phoned safety officer Fife and somebody says well I don't think it's that desperate yet and I guess I lost the head I went out and as I went out they were bringing my father's body in uh, he had went straight down uh, wasn't a mark on him not a mark on him the only thing that was different was his watch had stopped when when they had went down. His watch, I, I can't mean the exact time, but the watch had stopped. Well, I went and phoned my brother, who was at home, and he come roaring down. Uh, but obviously there was no... He just came down, got me... They arranged for transport for me to go home, and uh, <coughs> the neighbours were all, had all known by this time, you know. But... Um, Seemingly, the, there was a big, there was a court case about it. Um, I think it went to court. Or did my mother settle out of court? I can't remember. But seemingly, the, the, the reasoning behind it was the asparagus grass gives off dust, and it was just that lethal mixture of dust and the air and a spark, and that's what did it. You know, and that was just um, down the went. It just blew. As I say, Bill Easton went out the way. And he must have fell about 20 feet down, but he was out 30 feet, at least 30 feet. The other guy, how he got away with not a mark on him, we'll never know. Never know what happened with him. But Bill Eason was in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. I think my mother settled out of court for about £3,500 at that time, which was a lot of money to her at that time, you know. But uh, there was That was another thing that I learned over the years how to do the health and safety and get the best through the problems that you had, uh, which worked out pretty good as I got on to management and that sort of stuff, where I was able to deal with factory inspectors and that sort of stuff. Um, because bear hunting was so dangerous at that time, uh, and it still was even in the latter times. Uh, but when you were hand feeding, there were on two occasions I was at the side of a boy as he's actually feeding into the bottom cylinder and he put his hand too far in and he got his arm in there but I managed to get him round the waist and pull him out. Um, he just got burnt arm but it wasn't too severe like. But that could have been more severe if, he, if I hadn't been able to pull him because he wouldn't have been able to stop his cell going in if you get what I mean. Um, but in general, if you watch what you're doing it wasn't too bad, but like say calendars and things like that. Uh, the trial man that I used to work with, Morris Johnson, on number one to begin with, uh, what used to happen when the calendars was that you got a, a, a like what I call a blotch coming over in the paper, but it was wet because it wouldn't dried out and it stuck to the calendar and it was called a stamp. So it would make a stamp in the paper and you had to be looking through the sheet very regular checking, uh, there were no stamps or anything like that, and then go out with a blade and take it off. Well, Morris went in this morning, he was at his breakfast, uh, he left me 
we're sitting in the seat having our breakfast, the machine drank well, he went in to check, he ran his hand along, the next thing his hand up into the nip. Like a moot and his fingers were like shredded. No, just the points. I mean he recovered for it, but I'll tell you it looked bad at the time. Just it was like as if this part of his finger was like extended out like a nail. Um so basically that was a big danger like if you got caught there because you had nip bars that stopped you getting your hand in but it also caught you because it was only a small gap if you had it any bigger it would take your hand in so it nipped you and that's what it was caught in it but uh, he come out and he never even said a word he just come and looked at me and I says hi I see what you've done and at that time the mill being a dangerous place or paper making being dangerous we actually had a surgery uh, with a fire engine, it was, it was antiquated, we had an ambulance, which one night I took somebody up to them family in it, and I don't know, they're supposed to be comfortable, but uh, if you hit a bump on the road for the next mile, you were <laughs> it, was that, it was that easy sprung. Uh, it was a right old, old type, you know, the old shape one like this. Uh, I'd never driven anything like that in my life before, but uh, it was quite an experience. It was all sort of like sugar leaf when you were going out there now. But uh, there were many a time, I've been, I, I would say I've been, that was one, two, maybe three times that I've managed to pull somebody from the England just because I was in the vicinity like, and realised that it had reached in too far. Like, you know. <laughs> what was your favourite um, part of the job? Probably being a counter, I think, quite like that, yeah, because you had so many women. My mother was in the finishing house, but she wasn't one of my girls, and luckily they didn't. I didn't like to shout, "Mom!" Down the finishing house, see, she went to another counter. But you got, I think it was five or six women each, you know, that they brought their paper, and you actually made their wages up, because how many reams you got paid by how many reams they they done, eh? But um, I think, I think. The cutters was fun because you were young and the learn the stamping I, was good fun because you had two guys that, I, th I don't know if they were in peace work or not but um, they used to tie the, them into individual like I would done the wee parcels but they used to do big parcels maybe five to a bale and you had to stamp up the side before they wrapped the main and if you were too quick you stamped up the side of the paper and you got into big trouble for that eh? They would shout, but, oh, what are you done? Like, oh. <gasps> so they had to guillotine that off, take that print off, and then start again. But once it was all bailed, you stamped, if it was going to Africa or wherever it was on the top, you know, and then away it went. Hey, that was, it was good fun. And then the learners were good fun. But once you got to counting and overhauling, it was down to business, like, you know, it was good. Yeah. But as I say, once the system changed, I just... There was an awful lot of people just couldn't get enough paper. It was like getting as much as they could, you know, and it was quite, I felt it was quite a lot of greed there, you know, and I'd had enough, you know. The paper mill was just a great place to work because it didn't just um, teach you how to do, well, how to do the paper and what have you. It taught you, you made friends and usually a lot of your family you know, your surrounding family were there as well. But then come this time of the year, it would be a case of uh, the Christmas party. Well, the Christmas party wasn't held in, in the paper mill. No, it was held in the Queen's Hotel. <laughs> so it, it was great. It was really great. And then during the summer, um, we did bus runs and uh, days out, and the days out weren't always on the bus. They were merely in the train. Um, Aberdeen, Whitley Bay, uh, Isle of Arden, um, all these, loads of other different places as well. Um, they would just hire the train, and that was it. We were away early in the morning, we were away for it, we followed the whole train, and we were away for a whole day. It was just, it was just absolutely fantastic. And they had a fo football team. Um, 
yeah, the guys that got a football team going. And it was just, it was a brilliant place to work. With a canteen and two, uh, two of the girls from the, the, the learners would go round everybody in the finishing house to see what they wanted to get from the canteen for their breakfast. Because we started at, I think it was half past seven that we started work at, but we got a break about uh, 10 o'clock or something like that. Um, and then we, we got our lunch break as well, but then we finished work at, I think it was either half past four or five o'clock when we finished. But it was such a good place to work because the laughs that we used to get and um, it was just brilliant. It was a great place. I loved it. Mm -hmm. Social life. You've kind of touched on this a few few times, but what was the social life around the mill? Uh, it was quite good, actually. Yeah, it was quite good. <laughs> um, well, they used to have the paper mill trip. I don't know if you knew about Herd, but did you hear, will he tell you about that? No. Um, this was the good old days. They used to hire a train, believe it or not, a full train. And we all got on this train. I wasn't at them all. There was a, one to Aberdeen, one to Whitley Bay, one through Elargs where we went on the Waverley. I'm talking about the whole factory. That's the three I can... Maybe it was another one, but that's the three I remember. And... Um, they used to get on it in the Caden Station. Hundreds of folk that worked in the mill all went and we got away. And before the the train was at the station, I guess the men had a wee whiskey or a wee beer or something like that. Uh, and we got our lunch and we got our tea. And then we were brought home at night. That was a paper mill trip. Never had anybody getting left there, you know. But um, it was good. In fact, I had... Uh, as I say, my, my dad used to have a cine camera and he's, he wasn't very good at it, but he, he took it down to the station one of the mill trips that they went and he saw some of the people, but then there'd be blank bits and this bits and that bit. Uh, so years ago, my, my eldest daughter took all the, the movie cat things and put, got them on DVDs. And it sees, you see a bit of the folk coming to the station and getting on the train and they're all happy and waving and it was good. And then we had, I always had a, a ladies' uh, night in the Queen's Hotel in Verkeer, you know where that is? Yeah, in the high street. We had a party there, it was good fun, yeah. And then we always went late night dancing on a Friday. Who was that? Up in St Margaret's, a dance hall in Dunfermline. Working in the morning, still up at seven o'clock. But then we didn't really drink, you know. It's uh, there was no bar in the dance halls then, you know. I'd have got slaughtered if I had, you know, when I came home. Eh? But um, no, it's a good social life. A lot of parties and world trips and parties in the Queens and lots. Of, and then we had parties in the distillery. Used to be a distillery in Inverkeen then. Do you know Inverkeen at all? No, it's down near the station. There's a big, uh, a modern sort of flats. Well, there there used to be a distillery. It wasn't in operation then, when I can remember. And sometimes we used to have mill parties in there, like for the whole, for the whole shebang, you know, in the distillery. How were these all paid for? The company used to pay it for the mill trip, the whole mill trip. I don't know what it cost them to get a train, but um, no, it was a full train to Whitley Bay, Aberdeen, doing the water, it was great, yeah, we thought it was, oh, it was great, yeah. Um, especially the Mill Lake I see with the social club, it was really good, we had a car club, pardon me, and that was a garage round the back of the mill, and it was literally a garage with a pit, and if you had your car, had, most of us, we all had cars, in those days you could work on, on, on your cars, before they computerised everything and you can't um, do anything to them. They, but you could take your car in after you'd finished your work. There was tools there, you, all, all the tools, you could strip a car down and build it. I had a, one of the boys in the mill used to say to me, I'm going to weld your bonnet down, he says, keep you out of that bonnet. 
because I, I was always under the bonnet. I just loved to to do things like that. You know, it was it was really really good experience. And when when somebody was getting married, the female, um, well, um, we used to go on. We used to buy something first, and the thing that we bought was a little potty. And we could uh, we'd, we'd ask the, 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 the bride to be if it was a blue one or a pink one that they wanted, and they would always say. And then what we did, what we did was we filled it filled it up with um, I can't remember what we filled it up with maybe sand or something like that. And then we used to dress up the bride to be. And well, I don't know if I should say this or not. We used to get the, the stamping thing from, from the stamper's table and we used to get the teeps and we would spell out a word and the word was learner. And then we would go out on a, a pub, a pub walk. Well, at that time there was a lot of pubs in Inverkaden and we used to go around them all. But before we went round them all, um, well, the bride-to-be had to get stamped. So it was a case of bend over, pull them down a bit, and they used to get, they used to get learners stamped in their bum. <laughs> and then we would go round to pubs and uh, the pennies for the poor out when on the day that they got married. So we would get that as well. Um, I was lucky in the fact that I didn't get Le Leonard put on my bum, <laughs> but I did. Get, we did go around the pubs and get the the blue potty that I had. We got that filled up with pennies for the poor out because they don't do poor outs now when people get married. I, I don't know what they, th they maybe think it's not right, but they used to. Um, it was fun, really fun. And we had a thing called. Every year, the Smiths hired a, a train, and we went on mill trips. We went to Whitley Bay, we went to Aberdeen. Those are two of the main ones I can remember. I mean, Whitley Bay was absolutely amazing. We had, we were on the train. Go, oh, everybody met at Inverkeaton Station. We were on the train. Going down was very nice and sedate. Coming back was nice. Uh, it was. The, the beer got a hold of everybody, you know, and then you would see, oh, he's out with her and he's out with her, you know. It was it was so fun. It really was. I mean, everybody knew everybody. Uh, I mean, most of them stayed in Inverkeaden and Cowden Beath, actually. It was a big area for, for the paper mill. But, I mean, it was uh, some of the antics, you know, were really hilarious. Yeah. But uh, I, I think I was only ever on two. I would only be on two. Uh, I can't mind anymore. I went up to Aberdeen and I went to Whitley Bay. But 